So you're up in the mountain west, you're elk hunting, you're mule deer hunting, you're bear hunting, you've spotted an animal, you've done a stock, you're within what you believe to be your critical range, right? You're ready to take the shot. So you figure out your rest, you get in position, you look at your ballistics, you dial in your elevation, or you know your hold that you're gonna hold for elevation, and the next thing you do is you consider the wind, because you're a responsible mountain hunter. You look at the vegetation downrange, maybe even pop out a kestrel where you're at, you get a, a wind reading there, and then you might reference your ballistic application, and it tells you, okay, uh, it's a left to right wind, 10 miles per hour, my calculations are telling me that that means I should hold left by six inches. Most of us, it makes practical sense for us to just hold what we think that six inches is gonna look like on the animal, hold that to the left, and that's gonna be our wind hold. We go ahead, get back on the animal. The animal's most likely not in perfect position any longer, so we're waiting for that broadside shot. The animal's moved into some oak brush. It's a bear, he's working oak brush, so now we don't have a shot. All right, 48 and a half seconds later, perfect broadside shot. The bear comes out between two chunks of oak brush. Boom, we take the shot. We hit, gut shot him. Why is that? Why does that happen so often? Over a ton of elk hunts, mule deer hunts, bear hunts that I've guided, I've seen that exact process from hunters time and time again, the same either miss or poor shot made for the exact same reason. They think that process is right, but I'm here to tell you that it's dead wrong. The wind component of what I just described is highly flawed and it leads to a ton of inaccuracy in the field. And unfortunately, it leaves hunters much more confident in the shot than they actually should be. They don't realize how much additional volatility and variability there is in their shot because how they're looking at the wind and then how they're executing the shot during the wind. So let's dive right in. There's no doubt that folks are getting better and better equipped and they're getting better and better trained when it comes to these longer range shots on big game animals. I've got a whole video on how far is too far, kind of my thoughts on long range shooting. And there's really a bunch of tips and tricks in there just from a practical standpoint, just real basic stuff that if people pay attention to, they'll be able to execute those further shots and they'll be able to decide whether or not they should or should not be taking those shots. I'll stick a link to that video right up here so you can go check it out. A lot of times people will get some training when it comes to the wind in terms of how we think about it ballistically, right? They'll learn how to put it in their ballistic calculator. They may learn how to read it in the field with a Kestrel or even if they're lucky, they might learn how to use environmental variables, you know, the grass, mirage, leaves to read the direction and the velocity of the wind. All that stuff is great. But a lot of times what is lost in the training or just people aren't ever exposed to it is they don't understand how inconsistent mountain winds are. Winds have to move through the topography and none of this topography is you know straight up and down or perfect, right? It goes out and in and so there's all this you know, pressure releasing and pressure, and pressure compressing as these winds move through the mountains, right? Particularly when you add in thermals and the prevailing wind, you can have really crazy winds in the mountains. That's the norm, not the exception, is the wind to be very inconsistent and it typically cycles. If you sit in the mountains and you feel the wind, just go out there and practice reading the wind. A lot of times what you'll subconsciously do is you'll wait for a steady wind to come, and then you'll read the wind off of that. Even if you have a kestrel in your hand, you'll wait, you'll feel the steady wind, and then you'll hold the kestrel up. It's kind of an intuitive way to read the wind, and you'll be like, okay, there's the wind, I'm gonna read it, right? So the thing you have to keep in mind is that you're doing that because there tends to be this consistent cycle in the mountains, and you need to feel that rhythm to truly get a feel for the wind. And the other component of that is that because of that cycle, you can't just read the wind, get an indication, check your ballistics, figure out your hold, and then forget about that and go back to looking for that perfect position of the animal, right, and watch the animal move. Because what happens is that animal can give you the perfect position, but that's not gonna coincide with the exact part of that wind cycle that's gonna match to the wind hold that you're thinking. So you have to think about that big time when you're in the field. The proper way to do it is if you've got a guide, you've got a spotter, you've got a hunting partner that you hunt with all the time, have them call the wind for you while you're shooting. They don't need to talk to you about other stuff. They don't need to tell you about the animal being broadside, quartering, or that sort of thing. They just need to be focused on telling you when the wind is at the position and in the part of the cycle that you guys have decided on, right? So how, how this looks, this is starting to get a little get, bit confusing. Let's go back to how this looks, right? We see the animal, we're ready, we've got our rest set up, now we're gonna read the wind, right? With my partner, with my hunting partner, my spotter, we're reading the wind together, right? We're feeling the wind cycle and we go, okay, 
you know, that feels like five, 10. All right, that big, this big steady part of the wind cycle, that's a perfect 90 degree full value, 10 mile per hour wind. That's the wind that we wanna shoot during right there, right? So we're gonna hold for 10 miles per hour, but we're also gonna shoot during that cycle. All right, me and my partner have decided that. Now, when I get back on the gun and start to wait for that proper position of the mule deer, elk, bear, whatever, for them to come out in the open, for them to present that broadside shot, whatever I'm looking for, right? That's my duty, right? But my spotter, their duty is solely to tell me when that aspect of the wind cycle is arriving, right? So I can focus on the animal moving, presenting the shot, and then I can say, okay, I have the shot right now, the animal's broadside, right? I'm just waiting for my spotter, my wind caller, my hunting partner to tell me, send it. A really good terminology to use if you're the guy calling the wind for the shooter is you're feeling the wind, right? Okay, here's the little burst that comes before, okay. Now here comes that steady, full value, 90 degree, 10 mile per hour wind. Yep, we're in it right now, send it. And then during that wind, just silence and then as that wind as I feel that wind shift hold then the shooter knows okay don't shoot okay now on the shooter's end all the shooter has to think okay I'm waiting for this bear to turn broadside for me waiting for him to come out of that oak brush right okay he's come out of the oak brush he's broadside just listening for my spotter spotter says send it okay if I still if I still have the right position boom right if he says send it I don't have the position I'm waiting I'm waiting Oh, animal comes out, I'm still, he, he hasn't said hold, so boom, shooting during that consistent wind. So that's the type of process that you actually have to be doing in order to take advantage of wind calls when you're up in the mountains. Sure, if you're pronghorn antelope hunting on the Wyoming plains, out on the eastern plains of Colorado, sure, you might have a prevailing wind that you can call it now, and then you can take a shot in two and a half minutes and that wind is gonna be pretty much the same and your wind call and the ballistic calculations you do accordingly are all, are all gonna work out. But for the most part, bear hunting, elk hunting, mule deer hunting up in the mountains where you've got canyons and you've got wind moving through different topography that's pushing pressure, releasing pressure, you're gonna get these wind cycles, right? And you have to shoot during the time of the wind cycle that you've called the wind. This is really tricky for a lot of people and a lot of people don't think about it. And what happens is because they're not thinking about it, they come to the conclusion that that wind call is set in stone, right? So a lot of times they're just like, oh, okay, I can make this shot because yeah, it's eight inches or it's 12 inches of wind drift, but I'm making a wind call and I'm gonna adjust accordingly. And then they just throw the wind cycle out the back window and then they shoot. All right, so we're shooting my seven millimeter mag. Let's say we're shooting at a bull that's 400 yards away. We've read the wind and we're calling it a full value, 10 mile per hour wind left to right. So we're gonna have a hold obviously to the left. Let's see what that is. Okay, at 400 yards. These are pretty darn high ballistic coefficient bullets, so it's not too bad. It's 9.5 inches, right? So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna hold 9.5 inches to the left of the animal. If I'm looking at a broadside bull, that's just gonna be down his, down his, rib, his rib cage, basically right where I can see that rib cage start, start, to, start to edge into his paunch. That's gonna give me right in that like nine to 11 inches, right? If I do this properly, I have a partner call the wind for me, I shoot during the right part of the cycle, all that should work out correctly. But let's assume that I've actually just been shooting at ad hoc during the wind cycle, right? And this is gonna be most people I observe who a lot of guys who have even been hunting in the mountains for years that I'm guiding, they'll do this. They'll sit down once they have a, a wind call, once we've decided on a wind call, and then they just wanna shoot whenever. So when you do that, what you're actually doing is the same ballistic, uh, the same ballistic calculation. I'm at 400 yards. I know that I've got a certain amount of variability just because I'm in field conditions on a field rest. Realistically, most guys who are pretty darn proficient are gonna be shooting like a 12 to 15 inch group, right, with that three to four MOA hunting accuracy. We look at the vital area of an elk, if we get them broadside, that's still pretty solid. But if we introduce the idea that now we have an additional 10 inches of left to right horizontal you know, horizontal movement of that group based on the wind, all of a sudden it doesn't seem like it's that ethical of a shot, right? Who's going to just shoot at an animal and be like, all right, well, you know, my group's 13 inches, but now I got to add in variability of the fact that left to right, you know, I've, I've got another 20 inches between both directions. Very few people are going to shoot, right? Because 
You, you're, there's so many opportunities to make a bad shot or a miss. Most people are going to get closer with the scenario, with the variables I've given you. Don't don't read in to I'm saying anything ethical about 400 yards. I'm just giving you an example, right? A lot of people are going to be like, okay, there's way too much volatility there, but that's exactly what you're doing if you ad hoc shoot during the wind cycle, right? Sure, you've calculated what the wind's gonna do, but you're not gonna shoot when that wind is actually there. So the wind absolutely could actually be going right to left whenever you shoot during the wind cycle, right? Or it could be completely flat. So all that variability that's in that wind, and that wind's gonna deflect your bullet, now it's in, it basically just takes your group and explodes it, right? In terms of the possible outcome. So that's why this is so important to think about correctly. All right, so now this gets us to the second part of this discussion. I'm sure a lot of you are already yelling this at the screen or this concept at the screen, but who has the perfect partner ready to do that, right? Some of us are lucky enough to hunt with the same guides, hunt with the same hunting partners, the same family, the same buddies. We can develop that kind of relationship, particularly if in the off season we practice together, right? So that's awesome. But a lot of times we're taking shots all by herself, right? Or we have somebody new on the spotter, or maybe they don't have a good enough optic to see the animal. There's all these different practical variables that come into play, and we have to do it ourselves as a shooter. So one thing we can do is we can try to read the wind cycle at the same time we judge the body position of the animal, where the animal's coming out of the vegetation, uh, vegetation all of that good stuff. Some shooters can do that. You just have to make that judgment for yourself. If you have a fair amount of experience, if you've got your nerves under control, a lot of people can do that. It sounds like a lot, but if you practice a little bit, and in particular, you're not getting buck fever craziness, and you can get pretty obvious indicators. Like for me personally, a lot of times when I'm feeling wind, I use the back of my head right here, if, and, I, and I like to keep it unexposed. Like if I have a hood on or something, because I'm hunting in late season, I'll pull that down. I'll pull down even if I have like a scarf or anything covering my neck. If I've got like a baklava on, I'll pull that down because I shave my head, my head's bald, and so I can feel the wind right here. So I can actually feel the cycle of the wind very easily on the back of my ears and the back of my head right here, and I can feel, okay, there goes the wind change, here comes our steady wind. I can shoot during the steady wind. I'm waiting for that body position. I'm waiting for that animal to come out. Boom. Or, okay, I, okay, now I can feel it on the back of my head. Wind shifting again. I can no longer shoot. All right, animal came out, but I'm not shooting during the right wind. Wait, 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 wait. But there's certain conditions where it's going to be even hard for me. It's going to be very hard for experienced shooters to do it by themselves. And then if you just don't feel comfortable doing that by yourself at all, you can move to this idea. And I do, I do this a lot. Just factor it in is additional volatility into your group, right? So you figure out, you figure, okay, this wind cycle is going from, you know, five miles per hour left to right, you know, and then another part of the cycle is actually completely flat. The other part of the cycle, it seems to be going right to left by five miles per hour. So I'm looking at like a 10 mile per hour wind spread, all right? If I randomly shoot during the wind cycle, there's gonna be 10 miles per hour of variation. I can look at my ballistics. That tells me, you know, it's nine and a half inches. I can factor that in into my decision to shoot or not. Depending on the situation and the numbers, it may still make sense to take the shot or it may make, make better sense to just get closer and get a better shot, right? But the important thing is you have all the information. Instead of making a wind call and being confident that that wind call is going to just calculate perfectly into your calculations and is no longer variability in the shot, you're making the, the decision and the cognizant decision that, hey, I know this is introducing variability and therefore I can make my choice to shoot or not based on that. And I can tell you where this factors in for everybody is a quickly moving animal or an animal where you're only going to have a very short window of opportunity. So the last five minutes of shooting light, an animal you know, moving through a saddle, he's only gonna be there for 30 seconds. Those sort of shots, do not try to read the wind and then get a calculation and then say, okay, I'm gonna hold the wind, unless it's just a perfectly prevailing wind. And like I said, that's very rare in the mountains. In those situations, those quick shots, you can figure out the, is it really windy real quick? Man, there's a lot of wind. I've got to factor that into, you know, how, you know, how confident I am in this shot or there's no wind. Okay, perfect. Thing is in those situations, when the animal comes out in that gap, that very short window of time that you get to shoot the animal, there's no way that you can guarantee that that's going to coincide with the part of the wind cycle in the mountains that you need to shoot at to make that wind call relevant and take the variability out of it, right? This should give you a good feel for like, hey, like this wind thing, it's not like 
it's not like elevation, right? Because elevation is just about gravity, right? And distance. We can look at different ballistic coefficients and the different setups we have on our rounds, and we can decide, okay, this is what the drop looks like over different distances. And it's really not that big a deal if we calculate it properly and then we dial it into the rifle. Now, this wind thing, as you can see, is a whole lot dirtier when we're talking about mountain hunting because you've got this wind cycle and now it creates a lot more variability for anybody, right? It's gonna depend on your experience, how much that affects you, but it is an issue. So one thing that I suggest people really look at is look at the ballistic coefficients of your bullets. If you're planning on shooting up in the mountains at deer, elk, bear, and you're, and you're planning on shooting those ranges from 350 to six, 700 yards and beyond, you really have to think about how much the wind brings in in terms of variability. If you can work into using bullets that have a higher ballistic coefficient, you, you got to think about a whole lot of a whole array of other variables, terminal performance, all of that. You do have to think about that. But if you can start to shoot higher ballistic coefficient bullets, you're going to see when you look at your, your, your ballistic apps that the wind effect is way less. And that'll help you because it's going to take out a lot of that variability. All right, so let's consider essentially the same variables, right? We're shooting at a bull 400 yards across a canyon. We've got a full value left to right wind, right? So if we look at just an inexpensive factory ammunition, let's say Remington Express core locked ammo, we look at 400 yards, we're looking at 16.6 .6 inches of wind deflection. Let's look at a higher end bullet, a bullet with higher ballistic coefficients, the uh, 168 grain Nosler, 400 yards. Now we're looking at a wind effect of 6.35 inches. So there's 10 inches different. If you can use those higher ballistic coefficient bullets, you know, a holding, holding the fact that you've got to deal with all the other variables, including terminal performance, if, but if you can use a higher ballistic coefficient bullet, you're going to be a whole lot happier with your performance up in the mountains where you've got to deal with these inconsistent winds because overall it's going to suck that group down whenever you factor in the wind and you factor in all the variability around what I talked about the first half of this video. And I'll throw a little opinion here. If I'm shooting at elk, mountain goats, even mule deer, and I'm shooting sub 450 yards where I can keep that, that velocity at the animal above 1,700, above 1,800, 1,900 feet per second, a lot of times I'll shoot a burger because the terminal performance of those bullets, when, as long as you have that level of velocity, beyond that you have to be very careful because they don't work as well, but at those distances from 450 and less, for me, those burger bullets, they have a really high ballistic coefficient, so it helps me a lot in that chunk of wind from like 350 to 450, but I'm still happy with the terminal performance. They knock the shit out of animals at those distances as long as you have the velocity up. So that's one example where I tend to use a higher ballistic coefficient bullet. If I think I'm going to end up shooting further at animals, a lot of times I'll shoot a nozzler bullet instead because they perform better at lower velocities. But at the same time, I still retain that ballistic coefficient that helps me with the wind. If this type of video is helpful to you, I suggest you go check out How Far Is Too Far. I go over a bunch of similar concepts when it comes to deciding how far you want to shoot at deer, elk, bear up in the mountains. I think you'll love that video. Thanks for watching, guys. If you got a comment, leave it. If you like the video, like it and subscribe to the channel. I'll talk to you guys later.